Hi everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I work most of my time at Transport for London, but I'm from a public health background. Um, and I'm going to be taking us right back to the beginning, because part of the job of public health professionals is to help people who don't come from a health background to understand what's really important and what's not so important. Because we hear, if we read the papers and look on the news, almost a daily bombarding of stories about how how pomegranate seeds are good for us and then the next day then maybe they're going to give us cancer and it's very confusing to know actually where should we be focusing our energies and what should we be working on and what's the scale of the problem so I'll try and set that out to start off with. So um, the big question for us in public health is um, identifying what are the determinants of what keeps people healthy and what determines how long we live. So those are the two things we're interested in, living a long, healthy life. So um, the first one that um, comes up is one that some people think actually determines everything to do with their health and well-being. So there are many people, my father amongst them, who believe that um, how long they live and, and the moment at which they die is entirely determined by their genes. So he's very fatalistic. He believes one day he's just not going to wake up because it has been decided by his genetic makeup. So genes do have a role. This is a pie chart that I'm building up for you here. Um, so genes have a role in how healthy we are and how long we live, but they don't have a 100% role they only account for 30% of what determines how healthy we are and how long we live and the difference between individuals. So within this room, we're not all going to die on the same day. Our genes determine some of the difference between when we die and what diseases we get, but they don't determine all of it. So what comes up next? Ooh. Um, a small slice. Now, this was referred to earlier by Barry when he was talking about tuberculosis and some of the things that we used to really focus on quite heavily in the olden days when it came to urban design and public health. This is uh, environmental hazards. They account for 5% of the difference between the health and well-being and the life expectancy of individuals. So in the past, that little slice of the pie for environmental hazards would have been much, much bigger. But thanks to advances in medicine, antibiotics, changing uh, the environment that we're living in to make it healthier and reducing the impacts of communicable diseases, they nowadays only account for 5%, so not so big. The next slice of the pie is healthcare, which, and this one I think surprises a lot of people because we have the NHS and we really cherish the NHS and we rely heavily on it. We sometimes overestimate the role that healthcare has in keeping us healthy and in determining how long we live. So while healthcare is of course vital, it's maybe not as important as we might have thought in determining our fate in life. So. That's 45% of our pie chart. What do we think might be missing? So we've covered our genes, environmental hazards and our healthcare system, and we haven't even got to half of the stuff that determines how healthy we are and how long we live, which is interesting in itself. So what do we think some of the others might be? Diet. I'm hearing diet and exercise. Anything else? <coughs> Lifestyle? Let's see. Housing, let's see. Right, the rest of the pie chart is made up of two things that very much inter interrelate. One of them is behaviour, so lifestyle, and the other is social circumstances, which will include your housing. Um, so it's basically, in a nutshell, how we live our everyday lives. So that's heavily determined by the environment that we're living in. And if we take out the genes, because we can't do anything about genes, once you've got them, you've got them at the moment. Um, <coughs> and we just look at what's left. What we find is that um, how we live our everyday lives accounts for 80% of the difference between you and I in terms of how healthy we are and how long we live. So really, this is the core of, of what public health professionals are focusing on at the moment, is how can we help to shape and influence the way people lead their everyday lives to ensure that they have a happy, healthy and long life. So, little quiz. So we've said that our lifestyles have got a big impact on uh, 
how healthy we are and how long we live. These are the top 10 leading causes of disease in the UK, and the blue bars reflect the number of healthy years of life that are lost um, to the population. So the top one is very much bigger than the rest of them, and that is our number one leading cause of disease in the UK. So it's a cause of disease rather than the name of a disease. Does anyone have any suggestions for what the number one cause of disease might be in the UK? The, the, the biggest cause of years of life to be lost? Smoking, Smoking obesity, any other suggestions? Inactivity, any others? Lack of sleep. Alcohol. Alcohol, lack of sleep, these are all good. What about um, further down? Do we think there's any others that might not be the top one, but they might be in the top ten? Stress. Stress. Inactivity. Inactivity. Mental illness. Mental illness. Should we have a look and see? Number one was smoking. Now, smoking's really interesting because actually only 20% of the population smoke. And so the fact that it is such a huge long bar and accounts for so much illness and years of life lost just reflects what we were all taught and told by our parents when we were young, that smoking really is very bad for our health, because if you do it, it's not great. Next up, high blood pressure, obesity, physical inactivity. I've put them in bold because they're, a lot of these are somewhat related, um, but definitely there's a good link between those three. And um, if you added those three bars end on end, they'd come out much bigger than smoking. And another thing that makes them interesting is that unlike smoking, uh, obesity and physical inactivity are a social norm. So it's not a matter, unfortunately, of only 20% of the people being affected by it, as with smoking. It's the majority of us. Um, and then there's some funny ones in there as well, and I saw someone was laughing. Um, who was aware that lack of seeds was in the top 10 causes of uh, uh, unhealthy life expectancy? I didn't know this, but now I've got really neurotic about eating seeds because I'm determined they're going to keep me alive. So yeah, eat more seeds. It's definitely your pumpkin. Pumpkin, pumpkin seeds. You've heard it here first. Yeah. Forget <laughs> urban design. Forget the built environment. If you just eat enough pumpkin seeds. Well, well pumpkin seeds is especially important for cholesterol as well. So it, it lowers it lowers bad cholesterol. Andrew, if you got a job working for Holland and Barrett, are yeah, you going to bring yeah. some bags out for no, us no, in a no, minute? No, no, no. <laughs> Only enough. It's strange you should say that. <laughs> so. These, you won't be surprised to see the kind of things that public health professionals are very much exercised about at the moment, these issues. Um, there was a survey done, um, I think by Mori, um, asking Londoners how much exercise they do. And they were asked to answer one of these four questions. I exercise more than is necessary, which I like, because it just, I think it's quite odd wording. Um, I exercise about the right amount. I exercise less than is necessary, and I exercise hardly at all. Um, so what I'm going to give you now are the figures of what we said, and then the figures of actually what we do. So, 48% of Londoners believe that we exercise more than is necessary, which I love. The idea that there's something that is more than is necessary when it comes to exercise. 37% um, believe they do about the right amount. 10% concede that they do less than is necessary, and 5% said, possibly proudly, I hope proudly, oh, I hardly exercise at all. So that was, that was what we said. Then how do we do in terms of performance? 28% of Londoners exercise hardly at all, and I define exercising hardly at all by doing less than 30 minutes per week, which you might not think is possible, but a Almost a third of us in London manage to do less than 30 minutes of physical activity per week. What have we got next? 16% exercise less than is necessary, which means they do between 30 minutes and 150 minutes per week. You can see why the physical activity messaging hasn't really caught on, because it's quite complicated to explain. 55% of the population manage to do 150 minutes of physical activity per week. And I don't know what this concept is more than necessary because the more exercise you do, the happier and healthier you'll be until you hit a very, very high threshold that almost no one manages where their exercise is so excessive that it does them some harm. 
So um, we've got a bit of a mismatch between how we think we're doing and how we're actually doing. A bit of a gap there that we need to work on. As I said, um, health benefits accrue however much you're doing until you really reach a very extreme level. Um, even when you're doing a, a very high level of activity, you're still maintaining good mood, helping yourself to get some sleep, managing stress and all the rest of it by being physically active. But the biggest benefits come at the lowest level. So shifting from being inactive to slightly active is where the biggest health benefits come in terms of massively reducing your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke or getting diabetes or depression, etc. Um, and physical activity is something that we get very excited about because we see it as somewhat of a wonder drug in that it impacts on so many of the biggest causes of disease um, that we are facing at the moment. The healthcare system is creaking under the pressure of dealing with type 2 diabetes and depression and cardiovascular disease and we can prevent a lot of that illness and we can manage a lot of those conditions better if we're generally more active every day. In essence, you could say that the fact that we've chosen to design our lives so that we're exercising less and less as part of our daily routine, we've just replaced a lot of what we used to get from the exercise with medicines. So we now have medicines for um, keeping our cholesterol good and our high blood pressure good and keeping our mood good. And we used to get a lot of that just from being active as part of our daily routine. So how have we become so inactive? This historical photograph obviously shows how we used to live our lives. We would run around the countryside being chased by woolly mammoths and getting our daily 150 minutes. But something's changed. And I like to use this example, which is a street out in East London um, back in 1937. It shows um, a segregated cycle track and the pedestrians walking to work and the shops and going to school and there's the odd car driving past but it's nice and green down the middle of the street and you could cross the road fairly easily to get from one side to the other so that's how things were in 1937 and this is the exact same street now and when i put this up um a few weeks ago a woman in the audience said how did you manage to get a picture of, of Eastern Avenue with, without a traffic jam all, along it? I said, I guess the Google van must have gone out very early in the morning. Uh, so that's what it looks like now, but apparently it's normally a traffic jam. And you'll see that what used to be the cycle track is now the pavement, but the pavement is next to a very busy road, and there's a central reservation, so you can't cross the road. And you can see outside of the houses that there's at least one, if not two, cars parked outside of them. So the physical environment hasn't really changed, but our priorities on how we use that space have changed over the past 50 years, and that has had an impact on people's health. So you'll be unsurprised to hear that the only places in the world where the majority of people are getting their activity every day is when it's part of their daily routine. And we've got some examples of that in Europe, we've got um, bottom left-hand corner is Copenhagen, bottom right-hand corner is Amsterdam, and then you might be surprised that I've put a picture of um, Oxford Circus at the top. But that is because of the um, undervalued health benefits we're getting from our public transport network. We do incredibly high levels of walking in London compared with other cities and part of the reason why those physical activity statistics I showed you earlier showed London in such a poor light is because our national surveys for understanding physical activity levels don't tend to capture the walking that people do in short bursts as part of the public transport trips because public transport is not as comprehensive anywhere else in the UK as it is in London. So we do a lot of walking in London and half of it is either going to and from a bus stop, to and from a train station, to and from a tube stop. And that's not even counting the walking around bank station trying to find the other line because you followed the signs and they took you a weird way. So there is a lot of activity going on in London because of the way that we've designed our built environment and put in a public transport system. 
And the reason why we get excited about that is for all of these reasons. So this, these are the health benefits that we would get in London if we got more walking and cycling. And the reason why I put it up there is to show you depression in the top left hand corner and just how big a uh, chunk of the pie that makes up because often uh, mental health and mental well-being are forgotten about when we talk about the benefits of physical activity and they're huge and very important. So this is just a little graph to show you um, the proportion of trips that involve walking for at least five minutes. So um, overground train, the vast majority of people will walk over five minutes to get to an overground train station. Um, cycling, very little walking going on in cycling trips. It's definitely a door-to-door -door mode, but it's physically active, so that one's okay. Um, taxi, car and van, lorry, not so good, but public transport is generally good from a physical activity point of view. And people often say to me at this point, why don't you move the uh, bus stops further apart then people will walk further? But there is a threshold that people are willing to walk, which is about 500 metres. Almost everyone will walk 500 metres to get to something. Beyond that, the people's willingness drops off dramatically. And tubes, um, bus stops are 400 metres apart. So we get people to go the distance that we know that they're willing to go. And we don't try and make them go any further because then they might get in their car instead. So there's a lot of good science behind some of this stuff. I'm pleased you can see this. Um, this is taken from a report that I published uh, last year. It was an analysis of what would the health impacts be of delivering the Mayor's transport strategy. That's over here. So these coloured blobs are reflecting healthy years of life that are going to be gained um, by us delivering the Mayor's transport strategy. Um, and then over on this side, it's what would the health benefits be if all the trips that could be walked and cycled in London were walked and cycled. So it's a slightly artificial scenario where we looked at every trip that everyone ever does in London and we worked out if all the ones that weren't currently being walked and cycled but could feasibly be walked or cycled were done actively, what would the health impact be? And it's obviously huge. But the reason I put this up is to show you um, the relative impacts of physical activity, injuries and air pollution, because often people will say, well, physical activity is great, but surely the, the risks from road traffic, collisions and air pollution are going to outweigh, outweigh any benefit from physical activity. So physical activity here is in turquoise and air pollution is in grey and road traffic collisions are in blue. So you can see the Mayor's Transport Strategy is going to lead to a gain overall in all of those, but mostly from increasing physical activity health benefits. And even if we walked and cycled all the trips that could be walked and cycled, there would be a small increase in the number of years of life lost to injuries, but they would be massively outweighed by the benefits of physical activity. It's a bit of a complicated one, so if you can't get your head around it, I will show you the link at the end of the report and you can read it at your leisure. So... Physical activity, road traffic collisions and air quality are the three big ones that we focus on the most, but there's a whole load of other health impacts that relate to our street environments and how we get about, including anxiety and bereavement and sedentarism, which may be a word that none of you have ever heard of before, which means sitting on your bum, uh, noise and well-being and social isolation and child development. All these things are really important and they all relate inherently to how we how we design the space between our buildings, as well as how we plan out our cities and towns. And to bring all of them together into something that people can hopefully get their head around, um, I came up with this thing here, which is the 10 indicators of a healthy street. So it, it takes all of the health impacts of a street environment and it plugs them in and it says, right, what does a street look and feel like if it's delivering from a health perspective? So I'm going to take you through these 10 indicators and then I will tell you a little bit about some research that we've just done using these with an on-street survey. So, taking a street, these indicators apply to any kind of street, but here it's kind of a typical high street. Um, the first thing we might want to do is make it a nicer place to walk, uh, slow the traffic down, um, make it more inviting for our pedestrians, so we might widen the pavement put in a crossing in a place that's useful outside the tube station and put in 20 mile per hour limits. Then we need to make sure we've got some shade and shelter. That's important from a health perspective for two reasons. One of them is that everyone will get out on the street more if they can use it when it's inclement weather or very hot. 
and particularly with climate change um, and extreme weather events, we're expecting that we need to be more adaptable to that kind of thing. And um, the other is that older people, people with certain health conditions and young children are particularly um, vulnerable in extreme weather and they in particular need shade and shelter in those situations. So we need to accommodate the whole population, not just the fit and the brave and the well. We need to put in places to sit and places to rest, and that's not necessarily just formal benches. It can just be making sure pavements are wide enough that people can move out of the way of the through flow of pedestrian traffic to catch their breath and work out where they're going next. It can just be something to lean against, but we do need to make sure we put in places for people to sit because people who have injuries, impairments, people who are disabled, older people, people with young children need to sit down occasionally and we've kind of built that out of our environment in a lot of places and it excludes those groups who can't travel particularly long distances without taking a rest. We need to create an environment in which people feel that walking or cycling is something that they can build into their daily routine to keep them physically active. So that might mean bus stops so that they can use public transport and get some exercise as part of their public transport trip. It could be cycle hire and bike racks. It could be a segregated cycle track. All these things are important. But there's two other things that are picked out in this picture. Um, you'll see there's street lighting and there's also natural surveillance from the buildings looking out over the street. These are important for those spaces to feel active and safe for people to walk and cycle in day and night. People need things to see and do. There's no point in us taking a very clinical approach to street design, and I don't need to tell you guys about this. It's important to make sure that streets are stimulating and engaging places. We did some research in the autumn looking at the pedestrian experience in London, and we found, unsurprisingly, people are much more willing to walk in streets that they find visually engaging than on very bland connector roads in outer London, where there's nothing to engage them as they walk along. And we need to look at noise and air quality in terms of what vehicles are using a street, when they're using a street, what types of fuels we're using, etc., etc. So it's not rocket science. All this public health um, brain work that goes into it basically finds out at the end that if you can design a street that works for people, then it's going to be a street that's good from a health perspective because it's getting people out onto the street and interacting with each other, which is where the big health gains lie. So, is anyone familiar with these diagrams? I'll quickly take you through it if you're not. Last year, TfL led a process called the Roads Task Force with a whole load of stakeholders from across London where they basically looked at London streets and how they could categorise them and then work out how they treat different types of streets differently because the, the design solutions on one kind of street can be very different to the design solutions on another kind of street. So they came up with this um, axis of movement and place. So if you look at the uh, left-hand side graph, you'll see place runs along the bottom and movement up the side. So streets that have got a low place function and a low movement function are local streets, and they're in the bottom left-hand corner. Streets with a high place function and a high movement function are city hubs and boulevards, and they're sometimes the hardest to design for because how do you design a space where you want lots of people milling around and lots of vehicles moving through? That can be really challenging. Some of the easier ones to get your head around would be arterial roads, which have got a high movement function, their top left-hand corner, but a low place function. And then bottom right-hand corner, city place, which has got a high place function and a low movement function. So a classic example would be something like Covent Garden. There's not a lot of cars travelling through Covent Garden, um, but there are a lot of people dwelling in that space. So this was their matrix for understanding streets in London and working out what they wanted to do. And the healthy streets indicators can apply to any of these kinds of streets. So what we did was we... Um, turned our indicators into a very quick survey that we could do with the general public out on the street. And we went out onto streets from all the, these different nine street types. So we, we picked three streets in each street type. And we went out every day of the week, early morning, late night, middle of the day, speaking to different people and asking them to rate the street against those ten indicators. So in our survey, these were the things that we covered. 
Did they find the street attractive? Did they think the air was clean? Did they think it was noisy? Was it an enjoyable place to be? Did they think it was easy to cross the road? Did they think there was somewhere for them to take a rest if they needed to? Would they be able to find shelter if they needed to? Did they feel intimidated by the traffic? Did they find it a stressful experience? Did they feel safe from crime and antisocial behaviour? And did they feel safe from road danger? Now, these may all seem like very sensible things to ask. It's not the kind of thing that we've actually done much of in the past. We've tended to have an approach of asking people about their satisfaction level with our streets. Did they feel well provisioned in terms of street lighting and benches? But not necessarily how did they feel. So this was a lot about how, what's the sensory experience and how does it feel to be on this street right here and right now. And these were the results. So I'm showing you now uh, the same street matrix that I showed you before, but these were the scores that the general public gave the streets in terms of their healthiness. And I'll take you through them. So if we start in the top left-hand corner, our arterial road, which has got a low place function and a high movement function, overall, when you added up people's scores for all these different 10 indicators of a healthy street, people scored that 5 out of 10. We also asked them what they would expect for a street like that on each of those 10 indicators. And what they expected was that that street would deliver 6.4. I, of course, would like every street to deliver 10 out of 10 from a health perspective, but we, we thought we would ask people what they expected to see whether they could tell what kind of street they were on. So we didn't say, by the way, you're on an arterial street, look at this diagram. We just asked them the questions about how does it feel. But then by asking them what, what they expected, it gave us a sense of whether they were picking up that they weren't necessarily in the middle of Covent Garden when they were standing on Marylebone High Street, for example. So, arterial road was top left-hand corner. That's five out of ten. Not great, but not really surprising. Those are our, our highest movement streets. They've got the most traffic passing down them. Um, we score better down here in city places, which have a high place function and a low movement function. We got 6.6 was the average score that people gave them out of 10. But the expectation was higher, 7.2. So you can digest that at your leisure. I'll, I'll show you the link at the end. Um, but it was an interesting way of starting to see how we can use these healthy street indicators to assess our streets and see whether it's a useful tool for us to see whether we make, if we make changes to street, do people pick up on it and do they sense the health benefits that come from it? Um, and that's what we're looking at at the moment. These were the scores that people gave for each of the individual components of the survey. And they are grouped by whether the street was low movement, which means not so much traffic, up to high movement, which is in green, which means lots of traffic. And overall... Um, the higher the movement function of the street, so the more traffic it had on it, the lower the street scored from a health perspective. And the two indicators that it's all streets scored worst on were whether there were places to sit or take some rest, and whether there was shelter, which was interesting. And noise was also one that did worse. But also people's expectations on noise were very low, which was quite interesting. Um, so this is... The starting point is something that we hope we can develop into something really useful. Um, I'm just going to flick through this because we're short on time. These are the reports that I would recommend having a look at. I haven't filled my presentation with pretty pictures of lovely streets in London that have been done up and made healthier. But if you want to see them, read this report. And there's going to be a new edition of this coming out soon called Better Streets Delivered 2, which I really recommend. This report over here, Transport and Health in London, you can just Google the words and that will come up the first thing, um, shows you all those blue graphs that I showed you one of earlier that probably was a bit overwhelming. And then over here on this side, Improving the Health of Londoners, that is TfL's health policy and it sets out the healthy streets approach and it's got the full evidence base on the links between street environments and transport and health in London. And one that's not up there, but I would recommend reading, is Travel in London 7, which has got all the results of that health survey that I just went through. You have to flick to page 205, but it's well worth it when you get there. So, that's it from me, I think. Hopefully I'm all right for time. Yeah? Thank you.